Hi, everyone. Before we begin, please be advised that this podcast does contain adult themes, and it is intended for a mature audience. Listener discretion is advised. If I was ever going to talk about this for the first time publicly, I think that this would be the ideal time because this I really want you to understand this is why I'm so passionate about this. And it was some, like it was an incident that was traumatic for me but is small on the scale of things compared to some of the stuff that women go through and even some things that I may have gone through later. But this was really where it all started. So I'm 12 years old and it's my first time going to Saudi Arabia for the smaller pilgrimage that Muslims do called Umrah. So we get to Saudi Arabia and I am such a picky little American girl who like doesn't like to eat Arab food for breakfast. So my parents are having breakfast in the breakfast hall at the Move and Pick Hotel. I ask if I can go upstairs to get a granola bar from our room because I didn't want to eat the food. My parents are reluctant to let me go by myself upstairs, but I was throwing a fit. They're like, okay, whatever. So I go into the elevator and I'm wearing this outfit with this like silky pink skirt and this light blue shirt. And I'm, I'm 12, so I'm a child who's like barely going through puberty and I have my hijab half off, my hair is showing, I have like this light pink scarf on. And I get in the elevator and this guy follows me in. He's an older man and I see his name tag and I don't know why I remember having this overwhelming feeling of just like looking at his name tag and just memorizing his name because he starts talking to me and he says, you know, where are you from? Um, He can tell I think I'm American. So I say I'm from America. He asks me what floor I'm going to and I tell him the number and he says, oh, I'm going to that floor too. So he hits the button and I I just have this weird feeling. So I get off on my floor. He gets off as well. I go towards my room and he goes the other way. I get the granola bar and I go back to the elevator to go downstairs. He's lingering and waiting and comes into the elevator with me. And we were on like a super high floor. It was probably in like the 20s or something. And I click on the button to go downstairs and... I remember, like, him grabbing my hand and kissing it and, like, trying to push me up against the wall to... I, I'm, I don't know. I'm, this is so weird. I, I, like, have mentioned this so many times casually, so... Um, so I just remember him, like, put it, pushing himself up against me to, like, kiss me. And I felt so scared because he was so much bigger than me. And I just remember, like, as we were going down, I, like, just started trying to fight him, like, just kicking. I was, like, I was so small. And I was trying to kick him off of me. And I was screaming. And we finally got to my floor, the breakfast hall. And I was, like, I, I was, like, I don't know, f- fight or flight mode. I went into the breakfast hall and I just kept screaming, he kissed me, he kissed me. And so they found the guy and they had brought him out and he like could barely look at me. He like looked so ashamed, but he just kind of gave me a quick glance. And I said, yeah, that was him. And as soon as I said, yeah, that's him, the security guards or the police were like holding him. And my dad just beat the shit out of him. And I remember like for years after that, I always thought I saw his face everywhere. I'm Noor Tagori. I'm a journalist, but I also fight for causes that pain me. And one of those causes is violence against women and young people. That moment you just heard, the one in the elevator, That was the beginning of a journey for me, and I didn't even know it. The fear that I felt, the fear of being touched by a stranger, or the fear of violence, that never really went away. I'm 24 now, and ever since that experience, half my lifetime ago, I've wanted to do 
anything I can to stop creeps like that guy. And I mean, like, do things. Like, get up and go out and do things. I've covered stories on this. I've spoken publicly about this. But when I learned that sex trafficking was happening right here in the U.S., I knew I had to do this series. This is sold in America. The goal of this series is my goal, to understand how sexual exploitation and sexual violence, including sex trafficking, are happening right here in the United States. And then I want to figure out how we can stop it, or at least alleviate it. But here's the thing, I have to warn you, my journey to answer those questions has changed a lot of what I thought I knew about the sex trade. My ideas about who is a victim, who is to blame, and what changes we really even should be pushing for, all of that got flipped around. And I think if you come on this trip, you'll know what I mean. Those ideas that you have right now, whatever they may be, those things might get flipped around for you too. Sold in America starts right now. They see me on that corner when they went to work. They see me on that corner when they get off of work. Something is wrong. And nobody's never stopped and ask. I could go online and I could order a 12-year-old girl to be delivered to my doorstep within 30 minutes. It was that simple. I'm not a piece of trash. I'm a human being, and I don't deserve to be treated that way. It's not just wrong because it causes trafficking. It's just wrong. It's non-consensual sex. These sex workers that are doing things illegally have all these excuses. It's bullshit. It, trust me, it's bullshit. No, these laws they make have a body count. They know that, and they don't care. After that incident when I was 12, I saw that man in the elevator everywhere for, like, years. For me, his face was the face of sexual violence. And I was already in high school before I realized there are so many other guys out there like him, guys who are predators or abusers or take advantage of other people. Here we go. One afternoon, I was introduced to a type of violence I had never even thought of. I was watching Oprah with my mom, and I saw Nicholas Kristof and Cheryl Wudunn talking about this new book. They were working for the New York Times. They were based in China at the time and had heard of a term that literally meant the missing girls. And it was because there were like, I think it was a million missing girls at the time in China. And people knew what was happening, and it was it was trafficking. So they, like, delved deeper into it, and they realized it was happening in countries surrounding the area as well. And they wanted to do something about it, so they went and they did a ton of reporting on this. This book they were talking about, it's called Half the Sky. And they talked about it on all kinds of media outlets, like this interview with NPR. She was an energetic, bubbly woman smiling all the time. At 13, she was kidnapped, basically, by a neighbor. She was transferred from her village, which was in the middle of Cambodia, and brought to Phnom Penh, where it was an unfamiliar environment, and she was sold to a brothel. And she was forced to work seven hours a day. She didn't get paid a dime, and she also hardly was fed anything because they didn't want her to get fat. And at night, she was forced to stay in a tiny room with other girls, and they were forced to wear very little because they didn't want the girls to escape. To me... Half the sky was like this moral clarion call to end oppression of all women and girls. I went out and immediately bought it. And as a teenager, I have to say, I wasn't even prepared for the stories in that book. I remember the feeling of sitting and reading some of the stories over and over again and being like, this is not clicking. I cannot fathom. I have some of like the scenes that I read painted in my head. Like there was one of a girl who 
was escaping the brothel and she climbed out of the window completely naked, walked across like this, uh, this like piece of wood or something to get out, went to the nearest police officer and told him what was happening. And he sent her back because he was a client at the brothel and she just got in so much trouble. And she was my age. And I was like, this, is, this isn't real, this isn't real, this isn't real. This couldn't be happening. I was so upset. And then I remember feeling joy when I would hear some of the stories of these women who were mothers because they were having kids with some of the people they had to sleep with and being able to escape with some of their children and have access to some type of rehabilitation and education and being able to be empowered and start their own businesses and become important voices in their community. And I was just like, this is the solution. This is it. They have it figured out. Nicholas and Cheryl have this figured out. They wrote it in this book. We all need to read this. I remember telling every single person I could to read this book. It was my favorite book ever. And I wanted everybody to know that we need to fight for education for our women all over the world. So I watched Oprah and I was really ignited, like I was super passionate about going out and doing something. And we got lucky because my mom took me to a convention and at the convention we came across a woman who had a purple table. So we were drawn to the purple and she had these beautiful porcelain plates that were decorated. And we asked the woman who decorated these plates and she said, I run a homeless shelter for women and children and the women and children decorated these plates. And we knew immediately we had to get involved. So every month since then until now, we've conducted these monthly grocery runs where we deliver fresh food to the shelter in Baltimore and toiletries. So here are all of the, I don't even think these are all of them, but the packages, the packages that my mom has been making for our homeless community. That's my mom helping hand out those aid packages to people experiencing homelessness in Baltimore and D.C. So you can see where I got this whole change the world gene. I remember during our shelter visits, I would eavesdrop on my mom and the shelter director talking about some of the women's stories. One of the stories I'll never forget was a woman who came to the U.S., she was forced to work for someone without any pay. She had been sexually abused, and she showed up at the shelter with a plastic grocery bag. And in that bag, there was one thing, her only pair of underwear. And I think her story may be the first story of sexual exploitation I had ever heard about in the U.S., and after college, as soon as I got my first job as a reporter in local television news, I chose to do a story on a local sex trafficking survivor. Tina Front says she was first trafficked at the age of nine and got out of the life in her 20s. She founded Courtney's house as a safe haven for survivors. You know, when I was arrested at 15 years old as a prostitute, that was the first thing that was wrong. Because children can't be arrested and charged as child prostitutes because under federal law they can't sell themselves because they're a child. So the whole thing after that was all wrong. So unfortunately, I was obsessed with doing work in this sphere. And any opportunity I got, I took and I focused it on fighting sex trafficking. A streetwear brand called Listen Up Clothing approached me about doing a collaboration line for charity, and I immediately thought of doing the entire line themed around educating our girls, and half the profits of that line would go to a charity that was already fighting sex trafficking. That this is more than just a line of clothes, it really is a movement, and it is something that is really important to our society today, especially in a world where Women are constantly objectified and over-sexualized, and this is an effort to um, really wear on our backs the cause that we believe in. And, and uh, some of you listening already know that I later married the founder of Listen Up Clothing, but I promise you, that's not the point. As a reporter, as an activist, reducing harm to women became everything to me. I want to constantly talk about this and get people talking about it. So I started working with a team of journalists from Newsy. Their names are Kate, Eric, and Kevin. And we set out to shoot a documentary and record for this podcast. Okay, I just want to pause for a second. We're going to try something new here. 
we really want you to be on this journey with us. So I'm going to give you a special phone number. You can write it down or save it to your phone. And throughout this show, you will be able to text this phone number to get pictures of us throughout our journey and to just share your thoughts, concerns, and own experiences. If you want to see a picture of us right now on our first day out in the field, text the word CREW to the number 202-804-2480. That's C-R-E-W to 202-804-2480. And if you're driving right now, don't worry. The phone number is going to be in the description of the podcast, and I will be repeating it throughout the show. So please don't text and drive. Even before I started out on this journey, I talked to a lot of people who have been trafficked. But I've never worked on a project before where their voices were the focus. And that's what Sold in America is all about. The experience of this series, for me and for you, frankly, is to really listen to all of the people who are part of the sex trade and to really get to the bottom of why and how they're affected. And the first story you're going to hear is the story of a sex trafficking survivor. Her name is Chantel. We're only using Chantel's first name to protect her. She's still worried her traffickers are going to find her. The experience she tells me about, it didn't happen that long ago. Do you want us to take off our shoes? Chantel lives outside of Louisville, Kentucky. She's in a suburb with rows of beige townhouses. They all have perfectly manicured lawns and wooden fences around these tiny backyards. Beautiful. Thank you. I've never met Chantel before. I haven't seen a picture of her, so I don't know what to expect. I walk around the back entrance, and a woman with beautiful auburn hair and light freckles on her face opens the door. And she's holding this fresh, soft newborn baby with bright blue eyes in her arms. She's a miracle baby. Really? Yeah. Her name is, her middle name is Justice. So. You're okay. Oh, look at you. Baby, Wani, you want to sit up, huh? Oh, now you're a happy girl. Look at you. <laughs> now you're a happy girl. Mwah. Mommy loves you. If you want to see our crew with Chantel, text Chantel to 202 202- 804-2480. That's C-H-A-N-T-E-L, Chantel, to the number 202-804-2480. Chantel just moved into a new place. There are boxes everywhere and nothing is set up, so we have to take a seat on the floor. As soon as we get situated, she begins telling me that When she was 16 and growing up in Utah, her mom started spending time with some really bad guys. She kind of started doing her own thing. She started hanging out with bad crowds and started drinking a lot. And um, a lot of different people were coming over to our home. And um, I just kind of was, had to grow up fast and just hang out with the grownups. So... I was on my own, just trying to survive and doing what I thought I knew I could do. Right. And then from there, it just obviously went down and down and down. Um, I found myself in a strip club, and um, my a girlfriend paid me to just be with her, accompany her. And I said, yeah, I'll do that. And then once I saw all the money and all the, the girls, and I was like, I can do that. I ended up dancing with her and then going up pretty high with her level and um, that was the first time that um, also I actually had um, put myself out there and quote kind of escorted myself because I wanted these heels to to dance I needed some heels and so this guy offered me money and I took it and I remember thinking wow 
I can't believe that, but it was also, it was just so easy. What did he offer you money for? Um, to do some sexual acts. Okay. And then I went and got my heels, and then I started dancing. And you were just dancing? I was just dancing at that time, but I, I put myself out there <laughs> to uh, get those heels, those, those stripper heels. And that kind of just, it was just like, I'm, I'm already out there, you know, might as well go, go for it. After the break, the moment when everything changed for Chantel. Chantel had decided she wanted to be the best. So she went for it. She started meeting a lot of people in her new line of work, including one man who really impressed her. He was very professional, very clean cut, and looked sharp, very sophisticated. And um, I was like, I bet he's a pimp. He was the real deal. He flew out to Utah to have a meeting with us girls. And... I had nothing to lose. I had no kids, no nothing. I wanted to move out of state. And so I was like, okay, I'll do it. And I was like, the money all has to go to you. And he's like, yes, it's all will go to me. But you see my houses, my car, my clothes, you'll be all set up. And I wanted to be successful. I wanted to have a business, car, job. I wanted to get my boobs done. I wanted to do all these things. And I wanted to be taught by someone who knew what they were doing. Mm -hmm. So it made sense. So I agreed, and they flew me out there. The first night I went and worked in Arizona with him. Didn't know what I was doing. It didn't work out. I ended up getting wasted. I couldn't get this guy out of my room. So he's like, I'm flying you to Texas to be with this other girl who's going to show me how to do it. And I was like, OK. So flew me to Texas, and then I just remember this black Mercedes pulling up, very sharp and clean, and she opened the door, and she looked all sharp and clean, professional, makeup was immaculate, nails done, jewels, everything. And I was just like, whoa, <laughs> you know? Yeah. And then I got in there, got in the car, and she's like, you ready to work? And I was like, yeah. She put me in a hotel, and she just told me my quota and that I would be talking to her from now on. And so he would go through her, and then me and her would talk. Mm -hmm. And... Um, it was a whole system. Yeah, it was very organized, very corporated. And um, I was just totally, like, messy and sloppy at first. I didn't know what I was doing, and she was testing me to see what I knew. And once she knew what I knew, then she started training me and schooling me of what to do. And what how was the training like? She considered it, oh my gosh, I'm like scared to say stuff. If you're not comfortable saying anything, you don't have to. Yeah. Um, so I was like, all right. So I started doing it and it was just, it was, it was miserable. It was like back to back to back to back to back to back, just clients after clients after clients and um and I had to to, to upsell as much as I could because they gave me a quota of four thousand a day and so so you had to make four thousand dollars a day I I had to aim for that I had to and if you did four thousand they would withhold um Things that were promised to me, like getting the car or getting shopping, if I had a toothache, not getting to go get that taken care of. Mm -hmm. It would just be like a th two month prolong or a three month or a four month prolong. Like it was not some little week where I miss out on something. 
Right. I wasn't supposed to talk to anyone. I couldn't look at anyone. They, if you look at another man in the eyes and he's a pimp, then you're liable to, to, be, to go with him. What do you mean? Um, if another pimp, if you look at another pimp, then he can take you from your pimp. Everything was just so strict, and I, it was just like a freaking prison. What did your friends and family think you were? They thought I was had a boyfriend out there and that I was working with him. And everything was so strategic that they gave me money to send my family presents during the holidays to make it look like I was fine. The entire time Chantel is talking, she's clearly nervous. She's playing with her hair, she's looking around the house, and oftentimes she can't really look at my face. Her nerves make me nervous. And I'm thinking as we're sitting down how she's in a really vulnerable place right now. She has a newborn baby, boxes all over the house. She's clearly trying to get settled and there's still this fear in the back of her mind that someone's going to show up at the door right now. Someone she really doesn't want to see. I really admire her courage right now. She doesn't owe me this story, and she's doing this because she really wants to get it out there. She wants to help other girls too. I don't even want to interrupt her. I don't want to ask any questions. I just want to hear what she has to say. Chantel said things were pretty much the same for years. This pimp and his female partner set her up with a bunch of clients, and she always met them in hotel rooms. But she says she never even thought about it twice. This was just her life. Until one moment changed all of that. One day when I was in the hotel, I just decided to read a newspaper, and it was about a, a story about a girl who was have, she couldn't go anywhere, she couldn't talk to anyone, she couldn't look at anyone, just like I said. And she, all she did was work, 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 and she described it as invisible bars, which is so true. And that's when I just started crying and weeping. And I was just like, what in the world, what do I do? Because that's when I was like, that's me. That is, that's what's happening here, <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah. And um, so that's when I was like, how do I get out of this? My friend gave me the courage to start stashing money because I was like, there's no way I'm not going to sneak any money. No way. And I, I only did that for about two weeks, just enough to get out. And I had enough to get out after two weeks. Were you terrified? I was. So I finally, so the girl confronted me and she said, we see you've been on the internet and if you have a problem, you can talk to the, the man. And I said, finally, I said, you know what? I do have a problem. <laughs> I said, I see you and you're pretty and you have your jewels and your cars and everything, but you ain't happy. You're miserable and you're mean. And I said, I don't want to live my life to work. I want to work to live. And then she knew that time that I was finished. And she's like, okay, take care. I was like, bye. And so I left after handing her thousands of dollars, got on my car, and I just remember being like, oh my God, am I really free? Am I, am I really done, you know? Chantel was free. She made her way to Vegas to live with some family, and eventually she found an organization that helped her deal with her trauma. Now in Kentucky, she has a job, she has an apartment, and she wants to start her own business. This is the first time I've ever heard a story like this. It's the first time I really saw how this kind of powerful coercion could really trap a person. And it proved to me that not every story of trafficking is a girl in a basement locked up in chains. Chantel's story was just a beginning. In Arabic, my name Noor means light, 
And to be honest, I've always wanted to shed a light on the world of exploitation. I set out to travel across the country, to meet as many people as I could, to pass the mic on to them and let them tell their own stories, because I know no two experiences are alike, and each person matters in this. And I also wanted to figure out a solution. How can we make sure that this doesn't happen to more people? I'm going to be honest with you. I went into this thinking I was telling a story about sex trafficking. According to the federal government's definition, Chantel was trafficked. Anyone who's trading sex under force, fraud, or coercion is trafficked. And anyone trading sex under the age of 18 is trafficked. It sounded straightforward to me. People who are forced into sex work are considered trafficked. But the more people I met, the more I realized how complicated this is. My assumptions about violence and the sex trade were wrong. Whatever preconceived notions you have about sex work, I'd like to ask you to drop them for a minute. Actually, I'd like to ask you to drop them for the next eight weeks. I'm going to ask you to come with me on this journey. And in order to do so, you need to keep an open mind. And by the end, you might find that you're challenging your own assumptions too, just like I did. But listening back to Chantel's story, I also hear things I didn't quite notice enough the first time. Like the role Chantel's family played, the role drugs played in her mom's life that swept her away from her daughter. The picture of her life included a lot more than just awful men. And if you're wondering how much of this involves addiction, let me share this. When I told people I was working on a documentary about sex trafficking, almost everyone told me, oh, you have to go to Kentucky. Because in Kentucky, they're trying to tackle this at the root of the problem. If a, um, a victim ever said she didn't do drugs, I could say, and I would go on camera and I would, I would look her straight in the eyes. You're a lion. Every girl has to take something. How often are drugs related to the cases oh, gosh. of the girls who are coming here? Uh, 90%. Yeah. Yeah. Major, major. Next time on Sold in America, what Kentucky is doing and what I found out there. I really would love to know what you thought about this episode. Did you have any questions or comments? Did you remember one of your own personal memories or stories? And do you want to share those with me? I'd love to hear them. If so, record a voice memo on your phone of you asking that question or even telling me your story. And then text it to me at 202-804-2480. We'll gather up all of your voice memos and then use them in a bonus episode at the end of the season. Can't wait to hear from you. Sold in America is reported and produced by me, Noor Tagori, with Eric Krupke, Kate Grumke, and Kevin Clancy. The show is edited by Suzanne Reber and Ellen Weiss. Our executive editor is Peter Clowney. Sound design and original theme music by David Herman. Special thanks to Mark Fahey, Karen Rodriguez, Aisha Bakshi, and Rick Kwan. We also want to thank Andrew Haig for our collaboration with Ground Source. Sold in America is a production of the Scripps Washington Bureau and Stitcher. Our senior producer is John Asante. Our executive producers are Jenny Radelet and Chris Bannon. I'm Noor Tagori. You can find me on Instagram and Facebook at Noor and Twitter at ntagori. And I'd also love it if you checked out our video documentary. You can find it by Googling Newsy Sold in America. If you like this show, and I really hope you do, don't forget to rate it and review it on the Apple Podcast app. It really helps other people find the show. And of course, thank you so much for listening. Stitcher.